We're rolling. Timer starts now. Mark. Hi, I'm Ford. And I'm Sky. And these are not our real names. These are our superhero names, and with our powers combined, we form the writing partnership L. Skyford. Welcome to Booklandia. Today, we're going to review a book, most likely a romance. But before we get much further, did you know you can watch our faces do this episode by subscribing to us on Twitch at L. Skyford or YouTube at L. Skyford? You should really do it. We give good face. And sometimes there's a dog bomb at Ford's house. This is true. For our other socials, you can follow us on Twitter at Skyford L, on Instagram at L. Skyford. And if you're interested in our book, blog, or even more book reviews, head over to our website, lskyford.com. Lastly, this and every episode are chock full of oversharing and spoilers, and every episode is rated E for explicit. You have been warned. Ba ba bow. Hi. Hi. Um, today, for the first episode ever, there might be a dog bomb, just because there is actually a dog in the room right now. She's passed out and or dead, but maybe. <laughs> maybe. Okay. Uh, maybe. Disclaimer, not actually dead dog. Not actually dead. Not actually just, dead. Uh, just we, happily asleep dog. Yeah, we gave her a bath, so she's stress sleeping. That, I mean, yeah. that's the inverse of what would happen to me after a bath, yeah. but I get it. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> um, before I get too far into my whole life, uh, today we're going to be talking about To Love and and to loathe by Martha Waters. Let's see that beautiful cover. Yeah, I really like this cover. Yes, me too, actually. Very much so. It's super cute. Yeah. All right. Um, so I believe for the first time ever, we have a correction. Well, corrections so are required. I, I, I feel like this is more of a, an apology and less of a correction, but I... Okay have been wringing my hands for two weeks and I get, I, ju I just want to put it out there. So here, here it goes. This has to do with our previous episode on um, Act Your Age, Eve Brown. And I could not think of a word during that episode. Uh, <laughs> and I just kept saying that I am not neurodivergent. And the word I couldn't think of is neurotypical. So firstly, uh. my apologies to the dictionary for not being able to think of the word neurotypical. The second thing I genuinely feel like needs to be brought attention to is the number of times I said the word neurodivergent or the words neurodivergent in that episode. And I did mm. so uh, without really realizing it until I listened to the episode. Uh, and the reason that I kept repeating the same word is because I do not have the cultural humility to have better words, to have more words for describing people whose brain chemistry operates differently. And mm. this has become really self-evident to me. And I am going to look for more resources and to find more vocabulary to fill out my world. So I apologize for the number of times I said the exact same mm. word because I literally did not know how else to describe it. Um, and then lastly, and this is the biggest apology of them all. So Eve Brown, one of the trigger warnings in Eve Brown is about ableism. And early mm -hmm. in the episode, I talk about the fact that I am neurotypical, hence me not being able to remember the word. And then later in the episode, we talk about my um, attention deficit and how I stem, which is the most ableist I could possibly get, right? I'm like, my brain is dissimilar, mm -hmm. but it is typical. So the fact that those two sentences happened in my head within 40 minutes of each other just illustrate even further how societally we've been ingrained to categorize people into air quote normal and air quote not normal. And I, sure. I, I did it to other people while describing my brain. So that is my correction slash apology. Uh, I was ableist about ableism. It is ridiculous. And I am <laughs> sincerely sorry. And that I, is I my mean, correction. I, I applaud you uh, for, for putting yourself out there and self-correcting. And um, that's, I think that's wholly awesome of you. Uh, 
I am also uh, neurotypical. So like, I, I don't get to accept your apology. So that's not my jam. Um, but I do, I do know there's a lot of conversation happening about visible and invisible di disabilities and neurodivergence versus neurotypical uh, is a big one um, because I mean, the, those are invisible disabilities. So um, I feel 100% awkward about the conversation, the point I brought up about um, Eve Brown and having black and female friends, because that's a community I don't belong to 100%. And so uh, sh if I offended anyone, I am deeply sorry for that. That was not my place. I just wanted to point out what I saw. So uh, my bad, mea culpa, etc. That's a oh. great way to start an episode. Let's just, let's really just apologize for the previous episode. <laughs> exactly. I do on a completely opposite lighter note sidebar want to say that we're dressed in primary colors today. <laughs> we're in you're jewel tones. Red. Thank you very much. We are in jewel tones. I'm sorry, you're wearing red, I'm wearing yellow, and your hair is blue. Is that, are those not primary colors? So, uh, not to be, <laughs> actually, we match the cover really well. Sorry, I'm pointing the wrong way. The we cover <laughs> in, on the screen. Yeah, like there's a yellow frame on the yeah. cover. You have a yellow mm -hmm. um, sweatshirt. So my yeah. shirt is coral. Thank you very much. And so is the I cover. See. It, might, <laughs> and it might be my computer screen tinting it. I see. It, it's totally fine. And then the my my hair does match his jacket very well or the verbiage. Yeah. So we do match our cover really well today. Not we I did didn't not even think of plan this. it that way. No, no, I did not put this outfit on being like, I am gonna match this book cover so good. Uh, mm -hmm. My very last apology to the Eve Brown episode has to do with the graphic. Uh, for those sure. of you who watched the video of that episode, I forgot <laughs> to put up the Eve Brown uh, book cover. So if you haven't seen it mm. yet, Eve Brown came out today. Uh, sorry, today, the day we're recording, not today, the day you're listening to this. <laughs> um, yep. Eve Brown came out on, uh, spoiler alert, on when we're recording this, on March 9th. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> How dare you pull back the curtain on our mysteries? <gasps> <laughs> Sorry, we like to record things and then make clean them up. Who knew? Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, if you haven't yet seen the cover to uh, Act Your Age, E. Brown, get at it. <laughs> okay. It's super cute. On that note, how are you? <laughs> I'm primary colors. I had to wash my dog today. She still stinks, so we might have to give her another bath today. That's my day. How about you? How are you doing? I'm... Oh, I'm doing fine. I'm a little, uh, I feel like a little over the place and I don't, I feel a little all over the place and I don't know why. I can't even get that out of my mouth properly. Woo. So trying to, I'm just going to blame it on mercury and retrograde and we're going to mm -hmm. pretend that that, those are real factors that are affecting my neural pathways. Uh, I believe in mercury retrograde so they are in fact real things affecting your neural pathways it's possible i just genuinely don't know if mercury is in retrograde so it's like even if it yes. isn't that's totally what's happening yes it is epically deeply in retrograde right now uh excellent very good yes. um okay yes. shall we move on to talking about uh our lovely book that we're yeah. talking about today which is to love and to loathe by martha waters yes very let's dive thing. in Okay, so the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to try to sum up this book in 30 seconds. So yeah. you wrote this 30-second blurb. Do you want yeah. to read it or do you want me sure. to? Sure. I wrote it like a week ago, so I don't. I didn't even remember I wrote it. Uh, so absolutely. Yeah, sure. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, for all of you who cannot see our script, <laughs> um, it is a giant paragraph, so we're all going to yep. cheer when you make it to the <laughs> second mark. All right, I am I going to- I talk real to... fast. <laughs> I grew up on Gilmore Girls. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> all right, so I'm going to say three, two, one, and then mm -hmm. I'm going to push the timer button. All right. Give me one second. All right, three, two, one. 
In this historical romance, Widow, Diana, and Marquess slash Rake Jeremy strike a deal where she will give him an honest review of his performance in the bedroom, and he will discreetly spread around that Diana is looking for a lover. They arrange to execute the plan during Jeremy's summer house party, or whatever they call it in Regency. What is Regency? There were corsets? I don't know. England. However, Diana is also determined to win a bet with Jeremy that he will be married within a year. So also during this party, she's plotting and navigating social interactions between Jeremy and the other available women. Ah! <laughs> All right. Well done, you. Well done, you. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. It's because I have a decade of training in talking to actors when they don't want to listen to me, so I'm real good at getting it all out fast and concise. <laughs> okay, well, this very fast and concise uh, uh, description, sorry, Blur. my brain was like, whatever, what is a word, um, <laughs> comes out. So this this very concisely described book, there we go, that sentence happened, hey. uh, comes oh, out gorgeous. on <laughs> April 6th. So I... Uh, Put it on your to be read shelf and yeah. it at your local bookstore. Yeah, it is the second in a series, but we found, having not read the first one, that that didn't matter. Yes. So the characters from the first book, which is called To Have and To Hoax, are present mm -hmm. in this book, but you get a pretty significant lowdown on what happened to the other two characters. Mm -hmm. So if you have not read the previous book, I mean, do read it if you like these characters in this world, but you don't need to. You can start here and then decide. Yeah. So the really cheese stands isn't... alone. I'm sorry. Did you say the cheese? Yeah, the cheese stands alone. Is this a saying? Oh, no. Oh, no. This must be an American thing I haven't taught you about. Okay. we. I'll tell you all about this later. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. You're also, welcome. if anyone out there knows what she's talking about, fill me in. <laughs> Uh, yeah. There isn't really an antagonist in this book. How do you yeah. feel about a book that doesn't have essentially a bad guy in it? I would counter argument that society is the bad guy in this book. Societal Ooh. expectations for men and women, and those uh, the institution of marriage and uh, traditional relationship structures are is the antagonist of this book because that looms over every conversation is either about who's having sex with whom and who's marrying whom like that's the that's every conversation in this whole book pretty much so um that's my counter argument i to answer your actual question i didn't mind it i liked it i didn't need a bad guy this book didn't really need a bad guy or person so to speak um there is I would perhaps describe, uh, what is her name? I wrote it a little further down. Uh, Lady Helen? Lady Helen. She's kind of a heel. So there's a, there's a bit of a misdirect in where, you know, someone's playing the part of the bad guy, so to speak. Um, I didn't miss it. I thought it was cool. It was fine. You? Uh, I, I really like your observation that societal pressure might be the quote unquote bad guy in this. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, it is a, uh, I want to call it a court intrigue type book. It's not court intrigue at all. It's society intrigue. And yeah. um, so it doesn't necessarily need a bad guy, but it does feel like something needs to drive the plot forward. And their, their bet. So the, the, the bet that Diana and, uh, and Jeremy make with each other that he will be married in, in 12 months it didn't it didn't have a lot of pressure his grandmother put some more pressure on them but all of it mm -hmm. felt really gentle like these yeah. gentle pressures that are sort of guiding them along so there weren't mm -hmm. a whole lot of stressors and so some of their urgency like some of their determinate need to resolve certain things didn't come through for me as urgent as as all that because everything still so padded and like gentleness like sure. they still so, had 10 months of this wager yeah. by the time the book ends so it's like right. oh i was really hoping for it to stretch out to the actual uh -huh. 12 months and it didn't and so mm -hmm. everything felt a little low stakes yes that's exactly what i was gonna say stakes yeah yes cool yeah all right I mean, uh, 
it's cozy. It's a it was cozy very cozy. Read. Yeah, definitely a cozy read. Yeah. Very low stakes. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, this book thematically dealt with a lot of uh, a lot of the topic of um, freedom for widows, like the life of a that a widow has after her spouse dies, um, versus the lack thereof for married women uh, who has a chaperone, appropriate chaperones, getting married, all that stuff. Um, what, which do you prefer? Did you have any feelings about this? Well, so, <laughs> I mean, are we asking which do I prefer right now in 2021? Because um, uh, I don't need a chaperone anymore. But right, I see I just realized point. that the question I wrote was really dumb, and I was trying to make it better, and in fact, I made it worse. So no, I think you're uh, let's fine. talk about this topic. I mean, so here's what I, uh, there's, there's more about it later in a question that I'm going to pose for you, but, uh, firstly, there is a surprising number of young women with dead old husbands that, uh -huh. that are totally okay with this setup. In fact, it almost seems uh -huh. like the goal for women, for women without a lot of money in society in this book to marry an elderly gentleman with a fortune so that this elderly gentleman can pass quickly mm -hmm. and then they can be moneyed and widowed. And right, an it, elderly gentleman with a low sex drive. With a low sex drive who will yeah. not bother them. And yes. So that seemed like a really convenient singular solution. It, and so it felt very in world, like in this world rather mm -hmm. than in reality. And there were it, like multiple instances of this. And so it was like, this is what everyone does. <laughs> this is what everyone does. Uh, I mean, in this world, I do agree that that's exactly the setup. You marry an old guy, he dies, you get to be your own mistress with keeping your own mm -hmm. hours, doing whatever you want. Uh, whereas mm -hmm. if you're an unmarried woman, then the weight of being unmarried and the weight of being virginal weighs heavily on you and your age. You're, you're quickly yep. advancing at 19 <sighs> age. Blech. Yeah, so, Blech. I mean, sure, I agree that, yeah, I think that that's the case in this book, that, mm -hmm. yes, widows yeah. are much freer than... The, uh, their unmarried counterparts. But then we do have the character of Violet, who has multiple suitors and seems to have her pick of those suitors and does not mm -hmm. have a significantly uh, a significant chaperone, really, throughout the book. So I'm like Violet seems pretty free. I mean, she she has to choose a husband to alleviate. I guess I, I'm going to get some. Some people trying to tell me that I'm wrong because she does have to pick someone <laughs> to marry to take care of her father's de debts. But yeah, um, so I'm gonna. I I'm pretty sure we're all like hashtag that's book three. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, that's very likely that Violet is book three because there's mm -hmm. the three best friends and we yeah. already had the first book uh, and then wait, Violet is the third friend, right? Wait, is it or is Violet the first friend, and then this is Diana, uh -oh. and then the last one is? The... <laughs> uh, oh, indeed. Uh, -oh. uh, we are we are wrong. It is true, but yes. I don't. I don't have my Kindle. Wait, I do. Wait, where is it? It's way <laughs> over here. This is gonna make for great radio. Great radio. Oh, yeah. You're you're sliding way away. Yep. To. Here we go. Get... You can tell because my voice is way far away. I don't even know. <laughs> okay. So, it worked. It was I'll, far away. I'll power it up. Okay. Okay. Uh, so while I'll we're doing out. that, yes, while yeah. we're doing that so that we can actually give you their real, their actual names, their actual character their names. actual names. And not whatever it is we just came up with. Uh, <laughs> while you're doing that, I'm going to ask uh, this following, the following question. Okay. Uh, Diana decides to tell the truth about her feelings for Jeremy after uh, realizing that Lady Helen is risking so much for Sutton. Um, uh, mm -hmm. So to catch everyone else up, Lady Helen is in love with her lady's maid, 
who uh, is also a woman named Sutton, and they want to quietly disappear together into a village life without a lot of her comforts as a lady, and they're, she's perfectly happy to do so for the love of her life. How do you feel about that, that conversation that Diana has with Lady Helen when she realizes how much Lady Helen is giving away? How do you feel about that as the push that she needed, right? Because at the end of this conversation, she decides to reveal her feelings to Jeremy. And do you think there was a similar push for Jeremy? And lastly, I know it's multi, multi-part, but I think the answers are going to come easily. Uh, do you think that there should be self-discovery for both characters in the same way? So, I think... The realization for Diana and her learning about Lady Helen and Sutton's relationship was important in the aspect of if this is a feminist Regency novel. By the way, is this a Regency novel? They didn't wear corsets in Regency period, though. Correct. Uh, We never really, it's not really about corsets. They do wear, like... Uh, day dresses and night dresses. Right. Yes, but I thought this book talked about corsetry. Okay, at any rate. So, uh, I thought that was an excellent realization that Diana needed to have. Like, the world is bigger than this, and it's harder than this. So, she's having one of those I am privileged moments. And it sort of, I think it helped sort of it helped her realize what she wanted and how easy it was for her to have what she wanted versus what other people have to go through. Um, so I, I liked it as a push. It, I think it also appealed to her like needing to know everything and having all the hot goss um, for her to have that moment with Lady Helen and see behind Lady Helen's curtain so to speak, metaphorically, not actually, figuratively, sexually. Hey, oh. Ooh. You know what I, mean? Okay. I mean, one of them, one of them did. It just wasn't her. It just well, wasn't her. Um, did I want a similar push for Jeremy? I think, like, his realization was kind of almost more self-actualized. He pushed against it a little bit more, I think. But, um... I I like a little bit more self-actualization, but I thought uh, Martha Waters hit the right tone with both of them, kind of coming to the conclusion that they wanted to be together in in different ways, on different paths. That felt very natural. Yeah. Um, one of the friends' name is Emily, ah. and the other one is Violet. So is Emily... And- like the one we haven't really gotten the story about yet, right? I believe so. And Violet is the one from the first book. I yes. Okay, so we yes. we have an in episode correction. Fantastic. So Violet <laughs> is the friend from To Have and To Hope. Yeah. And uh, hashtag book three is hopefully Emily's story. <laughs> Because it might be there is an a disreputable theater owner that might <gasps> I know the swooning has already been done. <laughs> yeah. Uh I feel like every time they mention that he was a disreputable theater owner, I'm like, name a reputable theater owner. Come at me. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> industry hey, joke. look, it's it's an in industry joke. All right. Um, so I thought, perhaps, throughout this book, that Diana was a bit of a misandrist. I what do you think? I agree. Well, so, I think that Martha Waters mm. is, or Martha Waters is presenting this world in sure. which men are dumb dumb as a bag of rocks yeah Yeah. okay and women (laughs) ruled the world and now i do not mind uh love it a a heavy feminist lean and i appreciate Mm -hmm. it very much but it was very much like 
men are these puppets and we just got to yeah. tell them what to do and when to do it and how to do it. And then the world would just be a better place. And mm -hmm. I disagree on a personal level. <laughs> I, I think, I think, right, equity isn't the absence of men uh, or the right. presence of only women. Equity is the place where everyone gets a seat and everyone ha brings the same physical and emotional labor. And so this felt very leaning to one side mm. and so uh, <laughs> yeah it, uh, it, it was a little heavy-handed is what i will say it, it was a little heavy-handed to i agree with you and then some days some moments i think perhaps a little uh, perhaps miss andry has a place because we live so so much with so much misogyny in our lives to attempt to dilute it with misandry is a t giving some taste of our own medicine right if that makes any sense it absolutely like, makes what sense it feels like you like. have to yeah you have to push the scale way over mm -hmm. to the other side to really make yeah. the point that that is the side it sort of leads yeah. into the thing that i really want to talk about which is whether or not it is possible to write feminist historical fiction and whether or not mm -hmm. historical fiction has to be feminist in order for modern readers to digest it. That's a very interesting point because I I would say it's okay for historical nonfiction, like historical nonfiction to be not feminist is historical and therefore appropriate. But for fiction, uh, that's a very interesting point that I don't know that I have an intelligent or unintelligent answer for. Uh, why don't you, you have some thoughts, so I do. go for I it do. and let me see so, if I have a counter. Well, so I think that one of the, the big thing about this book and maybe this series in its entirety is that I think my interpretation of what Martha Waters tried to do is that she tried to present a very feminist view of a fictitious Regency-esque era. So that we could enjoy the dress up of the historical fiction without the 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 like the misogyny and without the mm -hmm. power dynamic of actual history. And that made this period piece really palatable for me, unlike, for example, Bridgerton, which is not palatable for me because it does contain those uneven power dynamics. And it does contain women that are not self-aware or sexually educated or mm -hmm. uh, pr try to acquire autonomy in a way that they do in this book. And I think for someone like me who does not really disconnect fully and dive into a book entirely, having a lighthearted approach to history that is heavily laden with feminist thought is a lot more palatable, a lot easier to mm -hmm. jump into than something that presents women as, as subservient because on that definition alone, I'm not interested in reading. I I mean, I would counteract that, or yes, uh, that the, the feminist portion of this book or the, the feminist view of this book did not stand alone because the book is still rife with patriarchal misogyny because that is still what Regency society is like. It's still about, you know, the men sit at the head of the table and they get to, you know, go out shooting and hunting. And it uh, it's still about finding uh, an appropriate male suitor to marry. Like there's still a lot of that structure in there. And this, again, to use this metaphor, di tries to dilute it. Yes, so, but but I wonder if yeah. without the dilution, if it wouldn't be some like right. I would not pick it right. up at all if it was mm -hmm. just telling a Regency story because mm -hmm. that feels like a like we've already done historical fiction when it was fiction, right? Uh, so right. I've already read the classics. I'm okay, but I definitely right. picked this up because it was a fun twist on a historical idea. Mm -hmm. And I absolutely agree with you that in terms of 
self-actualized women in terms of rising through the struggles that isn't really what happens right she she does yeah. she is self-actualized in her own way but then ultimately this is a, rom a romance between a man and a woman and they it ends on a happily ever after with her yeah. passion being a, a plot device really for mm -hmm. the final mm -hmm. reveal her right i really wanted her painting so she's a painter and she's a very mm -hmm. good painter but she does not believe that women have the place that that women have a place in the art world uh and mm -hmm. that their place is in the drawing room and that mm. and that that comment is never resolved she, well he he puts her art up on the wall in his portrait gallery yes so but, he is he has created a space for her art alongside these masters like didn't they say oh it's full of rubens his yes. portrait gallery is full of rubens and as a romantic gesture it was wonderful and i think mm -hmm. that worked really well for me but we never see her right. actualized we don't get the epilogue outside of, that. of their relationship right. yes in yeah. their relationship he acknowledges the importance of her work and mm -hmm. elevates her to to the status that that belongs to her yeah. and that's great but we don't really see yet again hashtag book three yet again <laughs> what the book also doesn't point out the fact that she's marrying a marquess which she's marrying up so she's still doing the she's still playing the game essentially so um so this book has a lot of uh, what what did you call it societal intrigue uh, a lot of marriage market navigation it, all the conversations about be, or about who's going to marry who um did you like this sort of thing in a book Do, are you, like it feels very pride and prejudice you know the classic like let's always talk about who's which sis, bennett sister is going to marry who um did you like it in this contemporary slash historical setting um no. i don't usually <laughs> no i don't usually like a societal intrigue beyond pride and mm -hmm. prejudice it has been done it mm -hmm. does i don't know that you could really perfect the the thing that has been done um yeah. if you are looking for like, if you read pride and prejudice and you're like i need so much more of just this this book is super fun i would label yeah. it as pride and prejudice with orgasms uh maybe because <laughs> pressure precious with orgasms would be excellent actually uh, i wanted more orgasms uh, and that might have really swayed me to loving this book a lot more it was a lot about yeah. the the societal intrigue it was not like it all started with this is going to be a sexual romp and the sexual mm -hmm. romp never went far enough for me and yes. so it just Hard landed thing. in the like it's just pride and prejudice Except mm -hmm. with that, right? They're they're not grump sunshine, but it's sort of a yeah. similar setup. Everyone needs to get married. Uh, I, we're gonna have a whole side episode about the fact that I think Elizabeth is not a sunshine. Interesting. Yes, we should have okay. a side episode. Okay. <laughs> we Excellent. Should, we should really do a Pride and Prejudice episode. Actually, we really should. Actually, um, shall we do do a little breaklet? Yes, let's take a breaklet. Excellent. Goodbye for now. Okay, we're going to take an intermission right here. When we come back, we're going to break down our favorite moment from the book. And discuss our ratings and if this book made us want to get naked. Please enjoy this message from one of our friends in the podcasting world. hello okay and we're back <laughs> we sure are that was the world's shortest break for those of you watching on video i was gonna say uh we try for brevity and <laughs> fail um, a lot brevity uh sorry i was thinking about bread never mind okay uh so we are still talking about uh to love and to loathe by martha waters uh and it now is time for our favorite 
and or most compelling moments hit me with yours so i think for me the most the moment when i stopped being frustrated with all of the bits and pieces of this book and just fell into a couple of good paragraphs was they play a game of hide and seek and they hide on this window seat with the curtains drawn so it's just the two of them the window and the back of the curtain essentially and he draws up his knees and he talks about his feelings about his brother uh and the the emotional destitute that he felt when his brother died and that he's actually really mostly upset about the fact that he's angry and not that he's that his his grief has morphed into anger and that to me that emotional availability was like oh i really like jeremy he's a really complicated mm -hmm. character and so the complexity of jeremy's character and the fact that he hides his true persona be behind this rake persona and that he mm -hmm. at some point recognizes that he is emotionally distancing himself from what he needs to process by sleeping with all of these women so his the depths of his character revealed primarily in that in that scene that was mm -hmm. my favorite part i don't know that for me diana had the same depth of character but jeremy was lovely yeah i agree uh i very much yeah loved the sort of psychological the psychology behind jeremy um for me it's either that because that there was also some um second base action in that scene as well that was it was fun it was like look i've always wanted a window seat this is giving me window seat hot shit vibes so that's uh, hard same must window seat immediately yeah must window seat immediately. Um, uh, the other part I really liked was uh, at the bit we talked about uh, just a little bit earlier with Lady Helen Courtney, uh, where she reveals her relationship with Sutton and her plan um, and why she acts like a complete twit all the time to execute this plan um, and how just shocked Diana is and how it you know it begins to crank some gears in her brain that eventually lead to her re more a uh, bigger revelation about the world at large herself at small and all the bits in between <laughs> yes um, um so <laughs> yeah we just opted at the same time <gasps> hot take for this book uh how what what are your short form big thoughts short form big thoughts I liked it. I, based on the blurb, I had a different expectation of the book. Uh, I thought that it would be more sexcapade romp, and it wasn't. And but I still liked it. Same. Yep. I, it, it, if Martha Waters is out there listening to us, give us more <laughs> actual sex, please. More Just like sex, the ladies in this book who constantly seek illustrations <laughs> of their genitalia so they can figure out what to do with it, yeah, I would like more instructional Regency how-tos. I don't know that you want instructional, you just want explicit. I would like a more explicit uh, yeah. sex capade. Same. Yes, yes. That's yes, exactly sure. it. Sure. Yeah. Um, Tell us how to take off those day dresses with those ampere waists. Do you undo a ribbon and it just falls off? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, exactly all right. So, works. did this book make you want to get naked? Um. Okay. So no, in terms of reading the on the page um, heat, but yes, because it made me so frustrated. <laughs> In, like I was, I was so hot and cold that I was like, "Sure, yeah. you know what? Let's get naked. It might alleviate <laughs> some of this frustration." So, sure, maybe. Okay, I, um, I am gonna say yes. I love a Regency fantasy. I love, you know, Darcy walking out of the pond, a man riding up on horseback, all windswept. I like a nice like. He's a lord, sort of allure. 
allure. Okay, I'm never gonna say that word again. <laughs> um, so it it was it, it did it for me. I would love absolutely something uh, raunchier, but it was yeah, it's not bad. Yeah. So yeah, uh, I thumbs up. I will at some point pick up the first one. I'll at some point pick up the third one when that comes out, and I'll I'll read about a a. Ill, uh, a theater Dis owner of ill repute. Yes, a disreputable theater owner. <laughs> disreputable. With, I think, a heart of gold. I think this book implied he has a heart of gold. It it definitely implied that even though he seems like a like a a bad sort, he uh -huh. would actually be a good match for Emily. Not about Emily. It. Perhaps he's a cinnamon roll. Uh oh. <laughs> I don't know if they knew about those in Regency yet. Um, what would they be? A hot cross bun? Oh, mm. nice, nice <laughs> British Bake Off reference. Well done, you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, should we oh. talk about what we're reading next? Is there is there a book to tease for next time? I don't think so. I think if you want to see what our next episode is going to be about, you should join our Patreon because we give a little preview of what we're reading, what the next episode will be about on our Patreon. I can tell you, I'm gonna pick up, what am I in the middle? I don't, I just finished, uh, you know what I just finished? Uh, uh, Siri, Who Am I? So you can go back into our, on our socials and uh, read my thoughts on Siri, Who Am I? There you go. That's, that's that. And Beckett, you never showed up. You never dog bombed this episode. You sure? Maybe next time. Maybe next time. You should stink, though. That's for sure. So are you, dear audience human, going to pick up this book now that you've heard our review? Let us know in the comments. Have a suggestion for another review? Slide on into our DMs. If you like this adventure in books or updates on our upcoming projects, please follow, like, save, subscribe, rate, review us on Instagram at l.skyford, on Twitch at lskyford, and on Twitter at SkyfordL. Phew, I'm Sky. And I'm Ford. That's it for this episode. We will see you next time on Booklandia, where every book is a whole world to explore. And we're out. <laughs>